uh, talking a little bit about manhood. Okay. Uh, a little bit about manhood. I want to uh, point out, of course, the uh, the idea of the young man, you know, the idea of the, what Iqbal also in his poetry called Mardi Momin, you know, the, 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 the man. And there's a specific word Quran uses for the righteous young man, you know, uh, like Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, a person until his, you know, by the time around his 40s, 50s, 30s, this time, uh, the idea of the the man of Islamic chivalry, right? The the young men who can make a change. If you remember, this word is used for Ibrahim alayhi also, when they said, uh, "Who is the people that you know put our gods into pieces to pieces?" When they when he had put the the axe by the shoulder of the big one, the big uh, idol, and they said, uh, "Innahu fata." There's that young man, right? And uh, so there is. This uh, emphasis of this word also in Sutul Kahaf, right? This word is also used for Dawud by the way. And uh, it's used uh, quite a few times, uh, three or four times in Sutul Kahaf. You know, is awal fitya to ilal kahfi. And when the young men, they sought refuge in the cave. And uh, you will also find this uh, when it refers to Musa in Khidr, for example. Uh, the, the young man, Yusha bin Nun, who was with uh, Musa alayhi salatu uh, wasalam, you know, he was also called Fata. Uh, and uh, so this idea of the young man, وَإِذْ Musa li fatahu, And when Musa said to his Fata, his young man that is with him. Now, there are two correlations that I want to build today specifically. That is between this idea of the young man and how uh, Sutil Kahf talks about construction over and over again. So let me give you a few examples. The breaking of the boat, right? Uh, the building of the wall of uh, Musa and Khidr, and then uh, building of the wall of uh, Zulqarnain, okay? Uh, and then you also have other aspects relating to the same idea, uh, which is farming. Right, so you have the, the 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 man with the two gardens, and then you have the Ashab al going and building, living in the wilderness. So one thing I want to mention, uh, when the scholars looked at you know what is the most halal food, uh, the first thing that they said, okay, the most halal food is the food that you grow yourself it's on your own land. You have your own land, you grow it. You do your hard work and it grows and you eat from it. And then uh, the second level is Al-Kasibu Habibullah, the one who works with his hands, right? And if you look at any of the uh, many, not all, but many of the great scholars, they were, um, they had a trade, okay? That's it. Like Imam Ghazali was a tailor, for example, okay? And other uh, great scholars, they had some trade. They weren't just teaching, okay? So they weren't just white collar. In other words, they had a trade in. They had, like you could say, um, the the education of white collar, but they also knew something in blue collar. Okay, and that's uh, something that I want to talk about today, when it comes to uh, manliness, because some of the studies show that the lack of true manliness. One of the reasons is, is uh, yes. Because, uh, you know, if a man wants to be, uh, you not proud is maybe not the word, but a man feels accomplished uh, when he has a trade, a craft, right? Uh, it can be even something as simple as a cobbler who fixes shoes. But it's much better than the, you know, the situation of the uh, young man today playing video games, okay? Uh, in terms of uh, what do you mean by trade? I'm going to share with you, inshallah. By trade, I mean uh, like being a plumber, building, uh, being a roofer, being um, being somebody who knows how to do drywall, being somebody who knows a little bit about electricity, being somebody who knows about how to fix the house, for example, being a handyman. Uh, these are important uh, aspects that 
you know, there are two pe- two types of people. There's ulul aidi, what ulul absar, people of the hands, right? And then absar, people of insight. So you have the man who is wise and he is like, and then you have like the person who works with his hand, right? And the the prophets of Allah, like for example, Dawud alayhi salam is called ulul aidi wa ulul absar. He was the man, a person who could work with his hands. He knew how to hunt. He knew how to fight. Uh, he knew how to use the sword. Um, but he also knew how to what? He knew how to make things with metal. That was the big thing with Dawud alayhi salatu wasalam. You have Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam building the boat. So you have these, you have Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam building the Kaaba, right? So this um, we'll goes to the essence of uh, what it means to be a man. What's the essence of that? Regarding this issue, I want to share with you this one point, and then after this, we will go and study the grammar, inshallah. Okay? So uh, let me just. Um, share this with you. Oh, let me introduce to you the book that we will be that you'll be listening from. Okay, it's a very good book. I really recommend it for any parent. Uh, especially, okay, uh, it's like one of the better books I've read uh, in my life, okay, one of the better books, uh, it was worth, uh, it had many, many great points, and it was worth every uh, moment, it's called, Uh, boys adrift, five factors driving the growing epidemic of unmotivated boys and underachieving young men. Okay. And so this is uh, becoming a greater epidemic, especially amongst the millennials, right? And uh, many sisters are married to uh, basically men, but they're a little bit lazy and uh, are not as motivated. And sometimes the wife is uh, a higher achiever than the than the brother, and this of course comes with its problems, and it's something that uh, our generation, my, the generation under me, suffers greatly. And so, anyway, uh, there is one point this uh, doctor makes, okay, and uh, <clears throat> that I want to share with you what he says about this, okay? So, let's listen to this. I hope it's not going to be too long. I'm going to play it on like a little bit faster speed so we can hear what he's saying. So this is the the audio version of the same book. Okay. Hold on one second. This toy with clogs up. He tries using a bar phthalate free. Hold on. In the closing chapter. Five. The fourth factor. Endocrine disruptors. Fish on the wild side. Sorry. For 19 years, I lived in the outer suburb. Six. End result. Failure to launch. Let's start with a lawyer joke. So there's this lawyer. He lives in a big mansion in an exclusive suburb. His toilet clogs up. He tries using a plunger. Doesn't do any good. So he calls the plumber. The plumber arrives, fixes the toilet, and writes up the bill. He one look at the bill and protests. You put down a charge of $250 for labor, the lawyer says. But you spent less than half an hour doing that repair. You're billing more than $500 an hour. That's more than I bill my clients, and I'm a lawyer. The plumber nods sympathetically. I used to be a lawyer, too, he says. What happened to money? Neil Brown started a plumbing business more than 20 years ago in northern Montgomery County, Maryland, near the border with Frederick County. Mr. Brown was having trouble finding any young men or women who wanted to learn the plumbing trade. We approached Frederick County Public Schools, Mr. Brown told me. We asked them whether they would help us set up an apprenticeship program in plumbing. They said fine, provided that we could recruit 12 students in the county for the program. Frederick County has over 40,000 students spread over 60 schools. How hard could it be to find 12 students, just 12? How hard was it, I asked. We found 10 in the whole county. Only 10 students wanted to learn plumbing. 10 boys, no girls. We couldn't persuade any girls to give it a try. I guess the idea of fixing backed up toilets didn't appeal to the girls, I said. Actually, we hoped that at least some girls would be interested in this. So we figured they might like the independence of being able to take care of plumbing problems and not have to go to school. But we didn't get any girls, not a one. I understand that most girls have a better sense of smell than most boys have, I said. So what did the school district say when you told them you only had 10 students? They said fine, 10 was enough. And the need for trained plumbers is so great in our area, we told every one of those boys that we would guarantee them a job if they just stuck with the program. Even an apprentice plumber can earn $50,000 a year right now if you're willing to put in some hours. And a master plumber? What does it take to be a master plumber? I asked. Four years as an apprentice, two years as a journeyman, then you take the exam. If you pass, you're a master plumber, Mr. Brown explained. And a master
master plumber can earn how much? $80,000 a year easy, and that's just working 40 hours a week. If you're willing to put in overtime, you can crack $100,000 in no sweat. Without a college degree, without a college degree, Mr. Crown said. And we explained this to every boy in the class. We said, just stick with us, learn this trade, and you are literally set for life. No college loans to pay back. You're set. Your job is secure. No engineer in Bangalore, no factory worker in Shenzhen is going to be able to fix somebody's toilet in Buckystown, Maryland. If you learn this trade and you do honest work, you are set for life. What happened? I asked. After one month, more than half the boys had quit. They had no interest in working. They just didn't care. Earning lots of money just seemed to have no appeal to them. We were down to three boys by the middle of October. That's when the district shut us down. I would have thought young men would have been motivated by the prospect of earning lots of money straight out of high school. Not many 18-year-olds can earn $50,000 a year, I said. I would have thought so, too, Mr. Brown said. John Kraft's Dilemma John Kraft, not his real name, never went to college. He started working in home construction right out of high school 35 years ago. 20 years ago, he started his own company specializing in custom remodeling of luxury homes. It's been a good business for him. Most of the jobs I do now start at half a million. Quite a few run more than a million dollars, he told me. And I've got a waiting list of work that's more than a year long. Now, of course, I don't take all that money home. Most of it goes for expenses, subcontractors, all that stuff. But John isn't complaining. His personal income is more than $300,000 a year. Not bad for a guy who never went to college. But John has a problem. He can't find good help. It's been more than 10 years since I've been able to hire any young man born in the USA and keep him for more than a month. Number one, these young guys nowadays have no idea of craftsmanship. Number two, they don't have any interest in learning, none whatsoever. John has a crew of six men, all in their 40s and 50s, most of whom have been with him for 10 years or more. I figure I'll keep everybody together another five, seven years, 10 years tops, build up my retirement fund, then I'm done. When my guys are ready to retire, I won't have any way to replace them. He paused. Boys today are lazy, he said at last. They don't want to work. They'd rather play video games. They just don't have any motivation. But human nature can't change in one generation, I said. If boys today are lazy, it's because our generation or our society made them that way. So what did we do wrong? What should we be doing differently? Miller and Long is one of the largest concrete contractors in the United States. Miller and Long built the huge football stadium for the Carolina Panthers. When the Internal Revenue Service decided to build new headquarters, Miller and Long poured the concrete for the IRS's 1,275,000 square foot complex. In recent years, Brunei, Egypt, Ethiopia, Ivory Coast, Singapore, and Turkey have all built new embassies in Washington, D.C. And guess who was hired to pour the concrete in each case? Miller and Long. Miller and Long also built a small health clinic in El Salvador. That seems a bit strange because Miller and Long does no business in El Salvador. The firm is headquartered in Bethesda, Maryland. So why did this huge company build a clinic in a foreign country at its own expense? More than three-quarters of our workforce is from El Salvador, is the answer I received from Miles Gladstone, Vice President for Human Resources at Miller and Long. They live here in the USA, but they still have family back home, and they're naturally concerned about their family back home. Building this clinic was one way we can support their community. Miller and Long also built about 100 homes in El Salvador after the big earthquakes there. The company spent a lot of money on that project, but Miller and Long wasn't the only company down there. All the big American construction companies were down there helping out. All the companies get a big chunk of their workforce from El Salvador. So you have trouble recruiting young people from the United States? That's right, he says. We are doing several ongoing projects to try to recruit young people, men and women, to get them to check us out. We work with the local high schools. We also recruit men and women who have just been released from prison. How successful have those programs been, I asked. Terrible, he said. We have maybe half a dozen success stories. They are the poster boys for these projects. Only half a dozen. Half a dozen out of how many recruits, I asked. Fifty? One hundred? Hundreds, he said. This was starting to sound familiar. I first heard about Miller and Long's good works in El Salvador from Jeff Donahoe, who was a neighbor of mine at that time. He and his relatives Just operated for a large contracting minutes. company, Donahoe Construction Company. Until he makes for several years, Mr. Donahoe made valiant efforts to recruit young people to enter the trade, to become electricians, plumbers, welders, and other types of skilled craftsmen. He would visit local high schools. He began his talks by asking students, how many of you plan on going to college? Almost all the students would raise their hands. Then he would ask, how many of you can tell me why you're going to college? What do you want to do that requires a college education? Usually only about five or six students, mostly girls, would raise their hands to answer this question. So he would continue. For those 20 of you who plan on going to college but don't know why you're going to college, I'd like to make a few suggestions before you take on $20,000 or $30,000 or $40,000 or more in student loans. I'd like you to consider a career in the trades. If you become a licensed electrician or carpenter, you can earn as much as your friends who go to college. You'll be earning good money right out of high school, and you won't have any college loans to pay back. He seldom found any student who was interested. In fact, he's given up doing the talks. I just don't get it, Mr. Donahoe told me. Most of these kids have no particular interest in going to college. They can't even tell you why they're going to college. But then when you explain that there are good jobs in the trades that don't require a college education, they just give you a blank look. I don't understand it. How come nobody wants to go into the trades, I asked. Mr. Donahoe replied, I think it starts with the parents and the teachers. They look down their noses at what they call blue-collar work. They think we're just digging holes and throwing bricks around. They don't have a clue that modern construction techniques are more high-tech than most desk jobs. We upload the architect's plans directly into our earth-moving equipment. 
which uses laser guidance and GPS systems to grade the site to extremely close tolerances. It's more like brain surgery than it is like building sandcastles at the beach. But the parents and the teachers think that if a kid doesn't go to college, that kid's a failure. We require smart people, highly motivated people who totally understand what they're doing. We're just not able to find those people in this country anymore. So we have to hire people from El Salvador or from Mexico or Guatemala and train them. Mr. Donahoe isn't alone in his observation. The social critic Dr. Charles Murray has observed that many high school students from middle class families go to college because their parents are paying for it, and college is what children of their social class are supposed to do after they finish high school. Those kids may have very little idea what they want to do at college. Few of them have given any thought at all to the trades. Dr. Murray's analysis is harsher than Mr. Donahoe's. A bachelor's degree in a field such as sociology, psychology, economics, history, or literature certifies nothing, he writes. It is a screening device for employers. The college you got into says a lot about your ability, and that you stuck it out for four years says something about your perseverance. But the degree itself does not qualify the graduate for anything. There are better, faster, and more efficient ways for young people to acquire credentials to provide to employers. Murray observes further that we have entered a peculiar age, an age in which physicians and lawyers are more plentiful than good plumbers. The spread of wealth at the top of American society has created an explosive increase in the demand for craftsmen. Finding a good lawyer or physician is easy. Finding a good carpenter, painter, electrician, plumber, glazier, mason, the list goes on and on, is difficult. And it is a seller's market. Master craftsmen can make six figures. They have work even in a soft economy. Their jobs cannot be outsourced to India. And the craftsman's job provides wonderful intrinsic rewards that come from mastery of a challenging skill that produces tangible results. How many white-collar jobs provide nearly as much satisfaction? Fifty years ago, even forty years ago, there was no shame in a young man choosing a career in the trades. Beginning in the early 1980s, and particularly after the publication of A Nation at Risk okay. in 1983, the consensus grew in the United States that every young person should go to college regardless of their own. The, the point is not to have a college education, uh, mm -hmm. and the point is not to be uh, no sociology and psychology, and those subjects are very important, especially for the Quran. The point is that um, Men, anthropologically, in different cultures, in different situations, however, be, before the industrial age, when everything was still in the agrarian society, um, everything was still agriculturally based, like in the Ottoman Empire, uh, knowing a trade was good because of the benefits it gave to man or to men regarding their self-esteem, right? That's the first point. Second thing is, of course, because why am I mentioning this? Because this is mentioned in Kahab. And why is it mentioned in Stil Kahab? Perhaps because these things will be important in the future. You know, my degree in psychology is not going to help me when the whole economy is defunct, right? And my degree in psychology is not going to help me uh, very much, maybe 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So either you learn trade or you learn some skill or you've got to learn how to fix walls, uh, because there'll be a lot of destruction going on. So people are going to need their walls fixed. Even in this bad economy in the USA, the housing market and the things around it, construction and so on, are still moving forward. Okay, I've had a, a, a roofing company for about 10 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and so it's been, you know, it's been, I mean, I don't put that much time into it, but um, there was a time I was putting a lot of time into it, and there's a lot of roofs that need to be fixed, especially here in the U.S. Um, um, and so that's that's one thing to consider, uh, not because you want to leave college. That's not my opinion. Uh, as this doctor was saying, something practical for a lot of Americans it's practical, but uh, for Muslims to be on top of the game, we need to be on both sides. We need to have ulul aidi and ulul absar both. Uh, and then, you know, the Quran as the, uh, as, as the main focus. So <clears throat> that's uh, one of the things I wanted to point out in terms of tafsir. And one thing that I realized um, about Sut al uh, was uh, the, you know, uh, was the construction aspect, whether it was the boat or, or you can say outdoors slash farming slash construction or uh, having a trade aspect, uh, it was pretty clear in the surah. If even if you go into deeper tafsir, you know, even for the uh, people that were in the cave, for example, a wall was built there. Once they went in and they went to sleep and then they died, the king of that time, uh, he put a wall there so that no one would go and 
Remember when they were having the argument, should we put a masjid here or should we make just a construction here? So they put a wall. So again, that's again construction. Should we put a masjid here or should we put a building here? So that's also, so there's a lot of emphasis on knowing about construction, how to build things, because you're going to be out in the wilderness. Do you know how to cut trees uh, and build yourself a small shelter? Um, do you know how to hunt, right? Like, uh, do you know how to fish? So these are all things related to Sut al-Kahf and particularly um, the the young man who is who has the, the the chivalry qualities, right? The qualities of feeding others before themselves, uh, feeding the family before themselves. Um, so that's where we have to be, right? That's where we have we have to be. Where, uh, but where are we today? Uh, is that you know uh, we like to be in the basement of our parents' house playing video games, uh, and and that's that's the dilemma that we're in. So we have a big transition to make. Each you know, especially the younger generation, has a big transition to make. Um, and so you know the way it's supposed to be. And I'll just say this very quickly. You know the the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu that the mother will give birth to her own master. So the purpose of, uh, of, of, of being born is that you move away from the parents, right? But over here, that the mother will give birth to her own master, meaning the master is there with the, with the slave, right? So the mother gives birth to her own master, meaning the master is there. Now the child doesn't want to leave mom and dad, wants to stay with mom and dad. Of course, in Islam, it's good for children to stay with their parents and, and, and all of that. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about the, uh, the lack of motivation to, to, to do something, to achieve something. So that's, that's missing. And, uh, and then, you know, like a lot of the brothers and sisters, they say to me, no one listens to me when I present them the evidence of the vaccines. But... If you're living in your mom's home in the basement and you haven't, uh, you know, you haven't practically shown yourself to be an adult and you're just living off your mom or your dad. And I'm not saying that about anybody here. I don't know the situation of 99% of the people here. Um, so if you're, you know, and then, and then you want other people to take you seriously, it's going to be very hard. If you want to be like the Sahaba, then you have to really be like the Sahaba, right? And reading the life, the lives of the companions of the Prophet is very helpful in this regard. When you see that what they were able to do and what they were able to accomplish, Khalid bin Walid was a general at the age of 18, right? Uh, so anyway, that's what I wanted to share. Uh, if I hurt someone's feelings, I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, we're here to learn and we're here to... Um, you know, to, to make a plan for ourselves, that how can we fit our lives uh, in a more productive way, especially to help Islam, right? So if you're not, if you're, if you're still, the, the, the child leaves the mom to go to the wife, and that the mother slave will become slave of her master means the, the child doesn't leave the mother and just becomes a master over her. And, uh, and then, you know, that becomes a difficult situation. Instead of the normal, uh, the natural process is the man goes out and he then, and then, and then a lot of brothers are like, I can't get married. And then a lot of brothers are married and then the sisters are complaining he's too lazy or he just is not that concerned about, uh, you know, um, taking his responsibility seriously. It's a serious issue. It's not an issue with the Ummah specifically. It's generally an issue with the whole generation. But if we can educate ourselves, then we can get ahead. You know, we can get ahead. So I'll just leave it at that and let's get straight to... Um, let's get straight to...